Okay, I think we can go ahead um, and begin. Um, welcome everybody to the Reefa Festival. Um, thank you all for availing your time and joining us within this segment of the festival. And this session is basically stream four and session two. And we're basically going to engage in um, the African trade and the formal and the informal economy and livelihoods. Um, please introduce yourself in the chat, share your name and basically where you're from. And then please do not hesitate to um, ask any questions as we go along um, to the speakers and basically all of us. Thank you. Um, the, so basically, the purpose of this um, stream is to basically share some enlightenment on how um, basically African trade and the informal economy and livelihoods have impacted um, to basically how we live today um, in alignment with um, the, what do you call this, in alignment with um, the coronavirus. So yes, um, that is what we will be diving into today. And we have two guests, um, namely um, our first speaker goes by the name of um, Mr. Our first speaker goes by the name of Mr. Kalbesa Mekhursa. He is basically a research, he's currently a researcher working for the Institute of Development Studies within the, within the business markets and state research cluster. He also supports the UK department, which is basically for the international development and the foreign commonwealth office. Um, he does this through the K4D program, which basically seeks to improve the impact of the development policy and also the programming within the use of the evidence within the um, policy. And then another thing that he also associates himself with is that he is interested um, in, a, in broad areas of development research and his main areas of expertise begin with development finance, taxation, private sector development, and basically developing and he basically does this in developing countries. Previously, he worked as an independent consultant and as a researcher for the Belgian Policy Research Group, and which is basically called the B D um, of Namir. So that is our um, first speaker. Um, yeah, I can just allow him to introduce himself and then we can introduce um, our second speaker. Well, to share his greetings, basically. Um, so do I start my presentation now, Zureka, or uh, you want to introduce C as well, or? Um, you can start your presentation now. It's OK, so, sir. I'll introduce uh, Mr. Sia when he starts his presentation. Thank you. OK. Hi, everybody, and thanks, Zolika, for uh, your uh, wonderful introduction, and uh, 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 it's uh, an interesting topic. Um, today, uh, uh, my presentation is going to be uh, about the informal sector and COVID-19 uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this presentation is uh, based on uh, a, per a paper I wrote, uh, in fact, uh, towards uh, the beginning of uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, so some aspects uh, might have diverged a bit, but uh, I still think there is quite some uh, interesting things uh, we can uh, find uh, from it. Uh, just to make sure that uh, my voice is heard clearly and there is no lag, I will turn off uh, my video now that you have seen my face. Okay, all right. Um, 
So the informal sector is uh, uh, really important for sub-Saharan Africa and by some estimates, in fact, about 80% of workers uh, in the region are employed in the informal economy. Uh, informal workers such as street vendors, market traders, market porters, uh, and uh, workers like them, they do provide essential uh, goods and services uh, uh, to the community, but particularly to the urban poor. Uh, the, the urban poor often buy necessities of life at lower prices in uh, rather smaller quantities uh, from uh, uh, those informal workers or informal traders. Um, sometimes or oftentimes in some countries, they operate without legal recognition and without being offered the necessary securities. Despite that, they do offer vital functions uh, through their informal trade. Uh, they are very crucial in particular areas, for example, in the food sector of uh, urban areas, particularly uh, they offer food security for the urban food. Uh, but apart from food security for the urban poor, they provide jobs, especially uh, for women or uh, especially less sk uh, uh, skilled or uh, um, uh, less uh, uh, literate women. Uh, informal traders are also very easily accessible, unlike uh, high-end uh, or formal supermarkets, so to say. They tend to sell uh, produces at much lower prices than uh, uh, formal uh, 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 supermarkets. Uh, they can sometimes offer uh, 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 goods or services uh, with credit because they tend to know their uh, customers as well. Uh, uh, they uh, allow smaller amounts to be transacted and so on. And uh, by uh, some estimates, uh, more than a third of households in Sub-Saharan Africa, they rely on, on informal food supplies uh, for their access to food. So uh, then you can see how really, how, what sort of an important uh, 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 job they do. Um, since COVID, the arrival of COVID, there has been considerable uh, impacts and shocks uh, to this uh, sector and uh, to these workers. Even before the arrival of COVID, the vast majority of informal uh, workers in the region, uh, uh, they don't really have good health and safety uh, uh, precautions and they were already uh, susceptible to risks. And uh, the arrival of COVID has only uh, exacerbated uh, those uh, health and uh, safety uh, risks. For that reason, uh, and also uh, because of the very nature of their work, they are, uh, they are more vulnerable to COVID-19 and associated health risks and also economic shocks. Um, they also uh, suffer from other underlying problems, uh, uh, for example, uh, vulnerabilities from uh, state supervision. Sometimes uh, police uh, men and women tend to uh, rough informal workers and so on. Uh, the arrival of COVID has also meant that there are extra uh, uh, checks and, and, and restrictions. These are only added to the challenges that they face. Um, marketers often work in crowded condition. Uh, street hawkers have very little access to hand washing facilities, for example, and also informal cross uh, border traders have to do uh, come to terms with irregular uh, enforcements and travel ones and so on. Um, unlike other uh, uh, better of uh, parts of the community, say workers in the formal sector, uh, informal traders have very low saving, often zero saving. Uh, their access to finance is also restricted. Their access to digital, digital financial platforms is limited and they live in uh, overcrowded slum areas. So they don't really have a lot of financial buffer also for uh, the sort of harsh restrictions, especially that were in place at the outset of the crisis. 
Um, few days of absence from work can lead to considerable uh, a financial setback to them. Uh, so this has uh, uh, really affected them. Uh, some surveys, for example, uh, uh, in, uh, in a Kenyan slum in Nairobi has shown um, from a study on 2000 uh, informal workers, uh, about 81% of them have uh, faced partial or complete uh, 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 loss of income uh, at the height of uh, restrictions. 70% uh, of those uh, that were studied uh, of the 2000 informal workers reported missing meals uh, because of COVID-19 and associated restrictions. And about a third of them uh, could not afford uh, to buy uh, sanitary uh, equipments like hand gels or, 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 or uh, soaps and so on. Next, I will say a bit about uh, the particular impact of uh, these uh, restrictive uh, measures. Uh, we could go on uh, to talk about those specific restrictions. Um, uh, just for the sake of uh, clarification, uh, a lot of uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa did introduce lockdown measures and restrictions a lot more stringently at the outset of the crisis. Over time, as uh, the community got weary and as the adverse, uh, the adverse effects of those restrictions really piled up, and there was also a lot of pushback from the community uh, through uh, protests and so on, those restrictions have been considerably scaled back uh, in uh, later months. Uh, in Ethiopia, for example, there were uh, restrictions of movements, transportations in different federal states. In Ghana, there were uh, restrictions, uh, especially in large ar urban agglomerations where informal workers are actually active. Uh, in Kenya, very uh, similar story in Mombasa, Kilifi, Kuali, and so on. In Tanzania, there was a, uh, a much lax approach, uh, thus we didn't see as much adverse effects at the beginning. Uh, you often, uh, this, is, this just goes to show how uh, 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 how uh, the top uh, political class views the crisis itself affects the health uh, uh, care responses because Tanzania at first uh, was really uh, not uh, too uh, concerned about the crisis primarily because of the president who uh, unfortunately is uh, thought to have passed away because of COVID itself. Uh, so in Uganda, Zambia, and many, many other countries, uh, there were restrictions that really did affect, uh, uh, urban restrictions that really did affect the informal workers. Uh, what sort of impacts were there? Uh, we have a sort of a mixed uh, uh, assessment. On the one hand, those restrictions have caused uh, uh, considerable uh, uh, financial uh, setbacks uh, uh, to uh, informal workers. On the other hand, uh, directly linked to the crisis, as uh, other formal sectors of uh, the economies of uh, countries in the region suffered, the informal sector tended to have swelled more because quite uh, a bit of those formal workers uh, either became informal workers themselves or because of restrictions, they started to rely on those informal traders a lot more. So uh, most people will not go to the city centers, uh, markets are closed. So they start to buy food, let's say from around, uh, from uh, an informal shop around the corner and so on. Uh, some economists even uh, uh, forecast that if these trends continue, we might even see a much bigger restructuring of the economy that might even favor the informal uh, sector. So as I said, uh, informal traders have particularly uh, adversely suffered from uh, lockdown restrictions in urban areas. Uh, in Ghana, for example, uh, because of school, workplace, transport closures and, and so on, and because street hawkers uh, and so on uh, 
uh, uh, uh, where one uh, were uh, prohibited to operate uh, uh, as before, and secondly, uh, their potential buyers uh, would not come into uh, the city centers or high streets, then they saw their demand uh, decline. So you see a much more uh, bigger effect. Uh, in Uganda, food vendors uh, were uh, affected because there were some uh, severe uh, restrictions on the way uh, markets operated. Uh, they uh, started to create uh, spacing. That means there were fewer vendors that could operate. There were uh, specific timing in which they could operate. That meant uh, then fewer hours to uh, uh, sell their items. Uh, specific uh, personal protection uh, requirements where there, let's say, masks of gloves. Uh, at this moment, these things might, leak, uh, might look easy to access, but at the outset of the crisis, their uh, PPE equipments were hard to come by, so they did suffer in such a way. Informal cross-border traders, these are also important in most African countries. Um, uh, because of these uh, uh, movement restrictions and be, because trackers that also uh, ferry those workers across borders stopped traveling, uh, they uh, considerably uh, suffered. Um, these are often people that buy item in a, one country and just cross uh, over the border and, 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 and sell uh, in uh, other countries. So we have seen this uh, in West Africa, especially uh, where uh, clo uh, informal cross-border trade is uh, a bit higher than other uh, African regions. There was also an impact on rural informal workers or what we call of farm workers. Um, Often these tend to be even much more uh, informed than their urban counterparts. Uh, and uh, because of lack of awareness and, uh, uh, and, and because of considerable disruption uh, to sell their items into, uh, uh, to get it to the market, because uh, often uh, their produces had to be uh, ferried to uh, uh, towns and city centers, and uh, there was considerable disruption to transportation. They did really suffer as well. There were some targeted policies by uh, uh, governments in the region uh, uh, to deal with uh, those uh, adverse uh, setbacks. Uh, one kind of policy is to create a special enabling environment or market environment. Uh, for example, uh, in Ethiopia, um, uh, the fruit and vegetable market uh, was, was moved uh, to an open space. Normally, this was quite in the city center. And uh, since uh, a space, uh, uh, spacing requirements, uh, uh, social distancing requirements require a much bigger space if you have to uh, create a market for equal number of uh, traders, then they uh, needed a bigger space. So it was moved to the much more crowded uh, city center market into an open market. Uh, in Ghana, uh, 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 the municipalities were offering disinfectants and so on because oftentimes those informal traders are too poor uh, to buy them. Um, in Mali, uh, about uh, 70,000 washable masks were distributed, for example, uh, partially through the help of the European Union. In Mozambique, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, uh, tried to help in improving hygiene and uh, sanitation uh, initiatives uh, uh, in these uh, markets. Uh, in Rwanda, in Kigali, for example, uh, they have shifted uh, food trading uh, from the city to uh, uh, another uh, distance uh, 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 place, uh, uh, sort of a move just like Ethiopia, and so on and, and, and so forth. Uh, 
Um, another thing uh, that uh, some uh, countries and governments in the region did was to reduce uh, fees uh, and uh, costs of uh, traders. So there was a, a certain market fee that they used to pay in normal times. And because of this complicated uh, set of shocks that are adversely affecting these workers and impoverishing them, uh, a lot of this market fees and associated costs were uh, lowered for them. In some countries, such as Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Namibia, Nigeria, dedicated funds uh, were created uh, to enable uh, the federal as well as local uh, municipalities to deal with this. For example, uh, to subsidize or offset uh, the lowering of fees or to cover uh, uh, personal protection or hygiene uh, resources, or for example, in setting up specific uh, uh, marketplaces and so on. Another thing uh, governments did was uh, in helping to expand digital and cashless transactions. So uh, this would obviously uh, lower uh, the risks uh, that come from direct contact, uh, contact using cash. And at the same time, also uh, the requirement of um, uh, the lower requirement of mobility through the use of these digital things. So uh, the uh, demand and supply of the market can be better helped. Uh, another thing is targeted financial support uh, to uh, those specific informal workers that are affected. Uh, some countries and uh, NGOs are already working this, uh, working uh, on this uh, in some places. Uh, 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 targeted communities and informal workers already have uh, uh, electronic and biometric ID cards. So you can even uh, inject or uh, give a certain lump sum uh, of uh, cash uh, to these uh, workers and so on. Um, Mauritius, for example, has tried to do this uh, a little bit. Um, in Zambia as well, the government has expanded emergency cash transfers, for example, uh, uh, and so on. But uh, this has been uh, seen in the slightly better of uh, uh, governments uh, than uh, uh, the other uh, countries. Um, in some cases, there has also been support for informal cross-border uh, traders uh, in East Africa, for example, uh, 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 an organization called the Green Trade Business Hub. Uh, uh, of the East African Green Council has tried to facilitate uh, uh, informal uh, cross-border trade. Uh, in Southern Africa, for example, there was also a policy initiative uh, that was implemented uh, uh, to ease uh, such things. Uh, um, for example, in Mozambique and Zimbabwe, this has been uh, done to a limited extent. Uh, but particularly in West Africa, there has been some limited successes in this. Uh, this in part links because even in normal times, there is a, a lot more a stronger cross-border trade. Uh, let's, let's say, for example, between Nigeria and other smaller countries uh, around, around it, even in normal times. Okay, so just uh, to conclude, uh, the arrival of COVID has meant that informal workers, informal traders, informal cross-border uh, traders uh, of farm informal workers, uh, mind you, informal workers does not include farmers. So this group have considerably suffered, uh, but uh, their suffering has eased over time uh, because uh, one, uh, government restrictions have considerably eased, and, and, and uh, second, uh, business activities uh, and uh, movement of people uh, has considerably rebounded. Uh, 
This is a, a complete departure, of course, in richer countries. This is because vaccine uh, penetration has been higher, but in a lot of countries in the region, this is not because people have become uh, uh, vaccinated, but just uh, there has been a fatigue and uh, economic uh, setbacks have been bigger. So uh, largely life has resumed uh, as before. Uh, in a lot of countries in the region, national and local governments have identified uh, sort of replicable ways of keeping informal traders uh, working. Uh, this has been, the intervention has been particularly stronger in the food sector, informal food traders, it means. Uh, this is because uh, this is a very essential, these are the most essential uh, of those traders, perhaps let's say compared to informal close trader and so on. Um, and also uh, making them stop working is going to mean uh, a lot of uh, urban poor are going to go hungry as well, uh, who buy from them. Uh, uh, multiple direct and indirect channels through which informal traders, uh, there has been multiple uh, direct and ind indirect uh, uh, channels through which uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, has uh, added to uh, the loss of income and vulnerability and also healthcare risks of uh, this uh, group of workers. However, uh, uh, they have proved to be uh, quite resilient uh, despite uh, the health and associated economic crisis. Uh, uh, the sector has in fact uh, become quite vibrant and even expanded in uh, a lot of uh, countries in the region. Uh, that would be the end um, of my presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, to all our attendees, um, please just don't forget to um, insert your questions in the Q&A box and then we'll attend to them um, near to the end of the session. So now we're going to continue and we're basically going to introduce our second guest speaker. And thank you so much, Mr. Calbessa, for your knowledge and sharing the broad um, basically, yeah, basically broad um, scenarios and facts of what happens outside of um, inside Africa, basically, because yeah, most of us don't know the actual critical details. Thank you for your presentation, sir. And now um, I will be introducing to you Sia, Mr. Sia Binza. So he is a political economist and applied advisor with an insightful understanding applied I mean, in international finance, public policy, the political, economic development and regional integration in Africa, along with development um, economics. And also, Mr. Sia Binza has also served in a variety of leadership positions in the South African government and the NGO sector. He is skilled and experienced in strategic planning, research, government, governance, development finance and management. So we will have our um, panelist, Mr. Sia, to basically share um, his views and his thoughts and basically, um, yeah, his views and perspective on this topic of the session. Thank you, Mr. Sia, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Zalega. Um, so my presentation will pretty much complement uh, uh, the presentation by Carl Bessa, um, who focused largely on the sort of micro experience um, of uh, the informal sector and informal traders on the continent. Uh, I will be focusing more on the macroeconomic issues, uh, focusing also on the processes that are taking place, uh, as well as uh, the impact then on the current trade and, and the new emerging dynamics as well as the possibilities uh, for further in improvement in terms of catering for the informal sector, but also improving livelihoods of uh, all traders and pretty much all Africans on the continent. Presentation. All right. 
start off, just giving an overview of my presentation, I'll start off with uh, an introductory in overview of the impact of COVID-19 on uh, African economies, then looking at some of the processes that are also taking place whilst we're faced with the pandemic in terms of African regional integration, and looking back at where we are versus the process and how it's unfolded over the past. And then I'll go into looking at what specifically African countries are trading, what are their major exports and the impacts and, and the implications of that, as well as what we're currently importing from the rest of the world, as well as the implications for that. And then I'll be looking at some of the new emerging trade trends and how uh, governments need to intervene in order to effectively create a new normal. Um, I don't think that as most people at the beginning of the pandemic thought that we would return to a pre-COVID normal, that I think we're going to have to create the new normal. And, and, and um, in many ways, the new normal will be very different from the past and what we've experienced. And then I'll close off on an overview of the impact of these trade dynamics on the informal economy as well as life roads on the continent. Um, so, yeah, so just before you start, um, I'm wondering if you should just switch your video off to preserve um, the bandwidth because we're looking at the screen anyway. Sure, no problem. Uh, the first thing I wanted to look at is the economic impact of COVID 19. As you can see, across the globe, a lot of countries faced um, significant um, collapse of economic growth. Um, and the African economy, and particularly maybe Southeast Asian region, seems to have been the worst affected across the globe. And on the continent, if you look at the, the top three economies, South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt, only one of these was able to register positive growth with Egypt registering a growth of 3.6% in uh, 2020. And South Africa contracting by 7%, whilst Nigeria contracted for less than about 1.8%. But overall, some of the key dynamics that are taking place is that uh, conflict-ridden uh, areas have been faced a worse economic impact uh, due to complete trade isolation, um, as well as the response in terms of national response in terms of closing of borders. And one example of this is Libya, which registered a contraction of around 60% of GDP in 2020. So that's more than half of the economy that Libya lost in terms of its production in 2020. And another impact was on small island developing states, your SIDs, uh, which was severely affected due to geographic isolation largely. And here the key examples are Cabo Verde, Mauritius, the Seychelles, and uh, Sao Tome and Principe to, to some extent. But really, these economies were severely affected with and have registered growth or contractions above 10% uh, in all of the, the examples that I've mentioned. And another dynamic that's been taking place is that countries that are dependent on, on commodities in terms of their exports have also faced a more severe economic impact. And here we're looking at examples such as Angola, the DRC, and Republic of Congo. And of course, countries that were already in a difficult economic condition and uh, in a recession effectively like South Africa and some of our neighboring countries have had it the worst in terms of the compounding impact of COVID-19 in addition to already existing challenges. And of course, the pandemic took place at a time when the African continent had just signed the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement and was really consolidating a process that has taken place over decades of unifying um, Africa, but also increasingly focusing more on unifying for trade or for business or com competition in a global economy. And of course, this uh, process of regional integration has rolled out to sort of three er eras, if I can call it that. Initially, obviously being unified by the need to defeat colonialism. And this is largely the period from almost the founding of the Organization of Unity, uh, uh, leading up to 
the period of the early 2000s uh, with the founding of the African Union, which then started a new sort of a revival of what unified African uh, uh, countries with uh, a much stronger um, push towards you know, pan-Africanism and standing up for Africa interests in a global economy. And of course, the key defining factor of these periods was that the regional integration was largely driven by charismatic leadership as opposed to uh, the current period, which is now increasingly being driven by the economic imperative, imperative of increasing intra-regional trade, imperative of increasing uh, the value addition of African countries in terms of their exports into the global economy. But centrally to all of this is that countries have also been struggling with how to resolve two legacies of colonialism that still uh, trouble the continent today. One being the arbitrary nature of national borders, which doesn't really overlap or coincide with the development of national states. So as a result, we've either had consultation over control over the state, largely also driven by ethnic identities, which has led to civil conflict in a number of countries on the continent. And in the only case where these borders have been reconsidered, in the case of Sudan with the creation of South Sudan, we're still at a very fragile stage in terms of the development of the state of South Sudan. And after uh, having recently had its 10 year anniversary, the country still hasn't passed a constitution, still hasn't formed a, 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 a democratically elected government with the current transitional leadership still struggling to implement some of the agreements that form part of um, the split and the creation of South Sudan. The other obviously is the major uh, 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 economic legacy of colonialism, which is the dependence on commodity exports. And this is a legacy which the African regional integration process has sought to resolve more directly. This through the creation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is targeted at increasing inter-regional trade, but also at uh, pushing for industrialization and further local value addition, uh, as opposed to the current dependency on raw commodity exports to the rest of the world. So what are African countries actually exporting and what was the impact of um, COVID-19 on exports on the continent? What you see on the left in the top image is a breakdown of the top five exports from the continent. And these account for more than half of our total exports at $122.4 billion in 2020. This is a significant drop from around $175 billion in, 2020, in 2019, uh, which the top five exports accounted for. However, it's still relatively in the same range that you know, the top five exports accounted for more than half of our total exports. And a large majority of that being crude oil, which accounts for about a quarter of our total exports, uh, followed by gold and other uh, uh, agriculture and raw mineral exports. But what we've seen in 2020 and the impact of COVID-19 is that uh, exports on the continent, total exports have declined quite significantly by about $50 billion from 273 billion in 2019 to where they were at 225 billion in 2020. And again, uh, really the issues and the, the driving dynamics there again is that countries with commodity exports have had a more significant impact in terms of their exports. And you might remember that in 2020 also, oil markets and uh, collapsed with oil uh, reaching or going below zero dollars a barrel at some stage, largely due to supply, oversupply in the global economy and uncertainties about growing or uncertainties about future demand given the global lockdown situation we were in. And what we've seen since then is a slight recovery, but obviously 
there has been a significant impact on exports with oil exports almost halving if you look at uh, the value in uh, depicted in the graph on the right. And again, uh, this has had an impact on the balance of payments for African countries, largely due to the deteriorating terms of trade. So what that means is that the value of our exports as African countries has actually decreased, whilst the value of the goods we import has either remained uh, stable or increased. So as a result, African countries, particularly those also who depend on commodity exports, have been faced with deteriorating terms of trade and balance of payment problems, which also have a knock-on impact on the potential for them uh, to industrialize. And what we've seen as a response to this is that uh, uh, there's been countries coming together uh, through the African Union and other regional economic communities in order to stand up for some of the interests of countries by putting pleas to the IMF in terms of providing further concessional lending to these countries who face balance of payment problems, but also on uh, the part of their creditors to provide debt sustainable debt, uh, sorry, debt service uh, uh, relief so that countries can reallocate monies that would have been allocated towards servicing debt towards the public health care response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what exactly are African countries importing? And you notice that the figures in terms of the top five uh, exports, oh sorry, the top five imports rather, is far lower than what we saw in the exports. And the top five imports accounting for about just under a quarter of our total imports at $61 billion. And this speaks to the diverse number of goods that we need to import, but the top goods being imported are petroleum, motor vehicles, med medic medicaments, which are medicines basically, uh, wheat, as well as ICT equipment, you know, largely cell phones in that, in that category, as well as rice. So there's all, all these opportunities for import substitution industrialization. What that means is there's an opportunity for African countries to create or beneficiate some of the exports that they're exporting in order to replace or substitute the imports that they import from the rest of the world. For example, in a region that is the number one, uh, sorry, where the top export is crude oil, the top import is petroleum. And this speaks to lack of refining capacity on the continent, but also lack of uh, industrialization on the continent. And it's a clear opportunity where uh, through investment and improving local capacity to refine crude oil into petroleum, we could eliminate a significant portion of our imports around about 10%, just over 10% based on the 2020 figures. And if you look at uh, some of the other items such as medicines, wheat and rice, which we could produce locally. And we've seen also, again, countries coming together, whether that be through the South Africa, India led trips uh, waiver in order to enable developing countries to produce commodity, uh, medicines and vaccines locally. Uh, um, countries have started a process of advocating for some localization of these top imports. And obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has been an increase, uh, uh, an interesting uh, crisis that has highlighted some of the strategic gaps in our dependence on imported medicines, which we could be producing locally if we do uh, have concerted investment in local production of pharmaceuticals. And again, there's just uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 moment has highlighted the, the strategic significance of um, substituting our imports on, on medicines uh, through local production. And as we've seen um, with the global hoarding of vaccines, but also uh, the divergence in terms of access and equitable distribution of vaccines, which I'll also speak to as that also has an impact on the recovery. So some of the new trends, as I mentioned, that there's a possibility that African countries can replace some of their imports through a process of concerted uh, or targeted import substitution industrialization. Uh, 
but this will require uh, strategic uh, in industrial policy interventions in order to attract investment in refining capacity on the continent so that we're no longer exporting crude in order to import uh, petroleum. Secondly, there are other areas where we could do the same. And as you've seen, our reliance on automotive imports and the opportunity created by the strong export of vehicles, particularly in Southern Africa, and as you can see in the, all of the regions have got a, a, a dependence on motor vehicle imports, which could be potentially uh, catered for through the productive capacity that exists in nodes across the continent, whether that be in Southern Africa, West Africa or North Africa, in the case of the countries which have capacity such as Ghana, Nigeria, Algeria and South Africa. And then lastly is the issue of strategic need to replace some of our imports such as medicines, but also things that we can produce locally such as wheat and rice uh, that we don't necessarily need to be imported from the rest of the world. So what you have here is a table just highlighting some of the top imports and exports. On the left is the top exports in each region. Again, uh, the what we saw as a aggregate of the continental exports, obviously uh, being uh, paralleled here at a regional level with crude oil still contributing a significant chunk, particularly in Central and West Africa is a proportion of exports. Again, gold and other uh, mineral commodity exports playing a significant role uh, in Southern Africa and the rest of the continent. And then here on the right hand side, we've got the top five imports according to each region. Um, and again, they highlight the possibility of us being able to substitute some of these imports with local production if we do have concerted industrial policy to drive investment in these sectors. So what does this mean for the informal economy as well as livelihoods? You'll notice that in a lot of what I've discussed at a macro level, there seems to be this sort of disconnect between what was outlined by Kel Besa's presentation in terms of the areas that informal traders trade in, whether that be uh, informal traders in the national context providing goods to the working poor or even cross-border traders uh, who buy and sell goods across borders. There seems to be a disconnect in the conversations that are happening at a continental level versus the impact at a informal economy level where a large portion of the population still depend on. So there's a uh, constant uh, optimism about the fact that Africa's continental uh, uh, free trade area provides a market now that has about 1.2 billion consumers. But at the same time, without finding a way to integrate the 60 or 70% of this population who relies on informal economy, uh, the free trade area agreement is going to be empty. And again, without finding ways to strategically replace some of the imports, we will not make the most out of this uh, continental free trade area agreement, just purely on the back of African countries not being able to produce some of the goods locally, but also lacking capacity, such as refining capacity to replace some of the imports. So this, inequality between the macro level at a, at a trade level and uh, the informal economy level is also kind of replicated at a global level. And what is depicted here is the capacity to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in each country. And the red is largely uh, uh, depict areas where governments have been able to only spend a maximum of 2.5% of GDP in responding that whether that be in terms of public health care expenditure, in terms of uh, supporting livelihoods or economic recovery from COVID-19 and all the various measures such as concessional lending, et cetera, which governments have provided in response. Uh, uh, and you can see that a vast majority of the African continent is in that less than 2.5% category with the exceptions being South Africa, and uh, I think that's Lesotho at 7.5% of between five and 10% of GDP in terms of the economic recovery, as well as uh, uh, some exceptions in the Sahel, 
and uh, the West Africa region. But it's quite clear that in the developed world, uh, you're talking North America and you're talking Europe, countries have been able to respond, you know, in upwards of 10% of GDP in terms of their economic response. So on the African continent as a whole, the IMF's total lending capacity is currently increased to about $1 trillion. Obviously, this doesn't represent all the borrowings or the lending to African countries as a whole, but this has been the only form of assistance that a lot of African countries have been able to access in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is paling in comparison to the global uh, um, response of around 11.1 or 11.7 uh, trillion dollars. Uh, if you consider some of the spending that's taken place in the US, as well as the European Union and the globe as a whole. Uh, and similarly, in terms of direct fiscal stimulus, African countries have only been able to uh, provide stimulus of around $49 billion. And you might remember that uh, in 2020 alone, we lost about $50 billion in our exports. So this money around 50 billion has been what African countries have been able to borrow from the IMF and other international or multilateral lenders in order to finance their response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, paling in comparison to the $6 trillion that um, direct fiscal stimulus that's been provided in the rest of the world. So what you're seeing obviously is a divergence in countries' capacity to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as what we will see next in terms of the distribution of vaccines, as well as how that will have an impact on the economic recovery post uh, COVID-19. And here you've got a depiction of the number of vaccinated individuals per 100 uh, people in the population. And African countries are currently averaging around 3% or three people per 100 people who are fully vaccinated in comparison to the rest of the world where uh, uh, they're anywhere between 20 and 30 per 100 people vaccinated. And this also highlights the difficult road ahead in terms of the economic recovery, but also plans to support the economic recovery by institutions such as the IMF, which have proposed a $50 billion plan, which involves vaccinating at least 40% of the population in all countries by the end of 2021. And if you look at where we are now versus these plans, it's almost impossible that we will reach these targets by the end of the year. And this is intended to reach an even greater target of 60% by 2022. So I think even if the IMF is able to provide this additional package to African countries, as we started seeing in terms of the additional allocation of the, um, the SDRs by the IMF, which African countries are expected to benefit from, I don't think that the, this will result in uh, the targeted level of a vaccination on the continent. Nonetheless, um, multilateral partners as well as multilateral financing institutions have also made a commitment to invest at least $80 billion in private sector in Africa over the next five years. And so my question, or oh, this to me leads to, you know, the elephant in the room being, you know, yes, there are all these plans, but will there be capacity? Because ultimately for the economic recovery, we need to have a certain level of control over the COVID-19 pandemic. And that depends on the level of vaccinations, which is currently the best response that we have. And even though countries have made and then the international financing institutes have made all these plans to invest this amount of money, I just don't see them reaching some of the targets. For example, the IMF target is highly unlikely by the end of this year. And which means that the other investment in private sector, which is supposed to spur on economic activity is also unlikely to be materialized. And so what one should expect is also a, a delayed sort of economic recovery which again then has an impact directly on the informal economy and livelihoods to which the entire uh, or a large portion of the population on the continent still depends upon. And I think in conclusion and in response to this, 
there are three points that I want to highlight. The first being that, you know, the recovery will be largely dependent on what African countries can create for themselves and the kind of context that we can create. Uh, and this will require significant planning and industrial policy and investment in order to ensure that we have uh, increasing industrial capacity to substitute some of the imports which we don't need to import. And we still need African countries to band together in terms of lobbying for their various interests, such as what we've seen with the lobby on debt relief and what we've seen on the lobby of the TRIPS waiver, which although has been a great success, still has had mixed results at best. Um, and so with all that said, uh, uh, the industrial uh, policies and plans to replace some of the imports will also need to find a way to accommodate um, the inclusion of the informal economy in order to ensure more equitable distribution of income at a national level, but also across the continent. Because I think without this, we're headed for the divergence that I highlighted, which is being reinforced not only by the different or divergence in talks at a regional economic integration level at a trade level versus what is needed for the informal sector, but also at the level of countries' ability to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as that aiding to issues such as vaccine access and equitable distribution, as well as the economic recovery post COVID-19. And I think with that said, uh, uh, I would like to see countries taking a more active role in terms of economic planning and policy, but also improving in their industrial uh, policy cooperation across regions and across the continent and continuing to uh, band together in order to lobby for our interest in the global economy. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Sia. Um, what we'll do now is that we'll have a Q&A session um, for both panelists. Um, yeah, we'll have a Q&A session for both panelists. And then one question I would like to ask first um, before anybody else goes ahead is that, so basically you mentioned that, um, so basically the impact in terms of percentage. So Nigeria had a negative 1.8 and South Africa had a negative 7.0% impact. Um, what do you think basically sets these two countries apart in term in the manner that COVID-19 has affected them? What does Nigeria have that South Africa doesn't have? Um, yes, may please shed light on that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, you want to respond to the questions uh, you know, one at a time or do you want to have a, a sort of group or bundled response? We can have a one at a time question, yeah. Okay, so I think to, to, to highlight the difference between Nigeria and one being that the Nigerian economy depends highly on commodity exports and that largely being crude oil. And at the same time, the, the mining industry as a share of GDP is quite negligible. I think it's anywhere between 15 and about 50% or third of GDP. And again, the Nigerian economy, almost half of it comes from the informal, informal sector, informal economy. So as a result, it has been able to be much more resilient than an economy like South Africa, which has a, a sort of unregulated uh, capital account or sort of open financial account and also a highly concentrated formal economy like South Africa. So as a result, uh, the economy has suffered severely as a result due to, uh, um, so firstly, the financial flows. So it's an ability to access uh, foreign direct investment, which it relies on in order to balance its payments because South Africa maintains a current account deficit. Whereas Nigeria has a current account surplus. Uh, uh, so as a result, it has been able to be more resilient despite the fact that oil prices have collapsed uh, because of its ability to borrow, partly from the IMF, but again, uh, the internal resilience of the economy, which depends 
on I think 50% of the economy is, is in the informal sector. So I think those are really the structural differences that have led to the divergent impact in the two economies. But again, um, these economies have also taken a knock, uh, you know, as you can see in terms of the contraction, but obviously far less severe in the case of uh, Nigeria. But again, what uh, Nigeria has been able to absorb in terms of GDP and its production, it's actually suffered more in terms of its external sector and balance of payments. Hence, it had to borrow much more from the IMF to plug that gap caused by its exports not earning as much. Hope that answers the question. Yes, you did answer the question. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so what we'll do now, um, Mr. Calbesa, if you have a response to the question that I just asked, um, please just shed your light on it. And then after that, um, there's a question on the, on the, yeah, there's a question on the Q and A. Um, anonymous attendee, would you like to ask this question yourself or should I go ahead and ask it for you? Um, please just write in the chat box whether I should ask it or not. And then, yeah, so yeah, basically that. Um, Mr. Calbeso, please share your response if you do have any. All right. Uh, in fact, Sia has uh, uh, explained it in a fantastic way, so it's hard to add uh, uh, more. So there is a structural difference between the two economies uh, that has been excellently uh, depicted by Sia. Uh, Nigeria is basically uh, a sort of... Uh, gigantic low-income economies and uh, a vibrant middle-income economy, but just by the virtue of uh, uh, exports of oil, uh, it has a, a big GDP uh, that puts it above bracket, but just the way its economy is structured is more in sync with um, uh, countries that are really at a lower uh, uh, levels of development. Obviously, South Africa is a much more, in fact, the most advanced economy uh, in the region. So uh, that sets them apart. And interestingly, Sia has also mentioned uh, the fact that uh, a, a huge chunk of uh, the Nigerian economies are informal by nature. So that sector has uh, uh, lower links with international trade. Uh, basically, that's uh, what has taken the bigger hit, importing exports, uh, and also uh, 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 capital. Uh, so uh, that sector doesn't rely really on the movement of international capital or international trade. So for that reason, it has been vibrant. So in a lot of uh, 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 countries like Nigeria, you see a GDP uh, figure that that's not uh, uh, highly uh, uh, affected or it didn't uh, show a big decline, but you see considerable uh, uh, falls in export earnings uh, and because of that uh, uh, um, reserves uh, and uh, capacity uh, uh, then uh, to import and so on. Um, I could in fact add Ethiopia uh, uh, in this uh, bracket and, and, and uh, many others. Um, Another thing probably that I would like to add is sometimes you have a, a, a longer term effect of uh, past macroeconomic trends. Um, South Africa has had uh, challenging years in the recent past. Uh, so um, although it will be difficult to clearly separate those, uh, uh, I think these shocks uh, often have the tendency to exacerbate uh, the adverse impacts of uh, already uh, 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 already prevailing uh, 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 adverse effects on the economy. So, for example, if you have a, a high unemployment, uh, low economic output, uh, below potential targets, 
uh, already suffering international trade links, uh, already weak financial position and thus uh, 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 already subdued uh, financial inflows, international financial inflows, just an additional layer of uh, setbacks are going to further amplify the effects of uh, those uh, existing shocks. Uh, that's all. Thank you. No, so thank you so much, Mr. Kabesa. Um, okay, so we have a question right now from okay, Anonymous. And the question is, I'm not sure who it's directed to, but yes. Um, the question is, how do we justify saying vaccination is a best response in a continent that's managed to be somewhat open without a vaccine, without vaccine levels of the westernized countries? And with the current statement on ineffectiveness of the vaccine to the Delta and other variants. And then the second follow up question is, should we not be using healthcare strategies and intervention and interventions that have shown success within the continent while focusing on capacitating ourselves to be producers of healthcare um, products to lessen this dependency on the West. So yeah, I think what this person's saying, what is the point of using um, the current vaccine, um, knowing that um, there are still other variants, is it conducive? And then, yeah, I think they're also saying that, um, I think they're speaking about reliance to the West. Um, yes, I think Mr. Sia, this is um, directed to you. Um, can you please answer this? And then um, Salim, you had a question. Would you like me to ask it for you or would you like um, yeah, to ask the question yourself? Um, please respond in the chat box and we can move over to Mr. Binza. Thank you very much. Hello, sir. Um, Mr. Sia, did you, were you able to hear what the question was? Uh, yes, sorry, I thought we were waiting for Salim to make a comment. Okay, I can respond to that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the issue of vaccination has become almost as controversial as like the God question, does God exist or not? <laughs> so I'm going to be clear on one thing. There's just no response to the COVID-19 pandemic that excludes the public health care response. Currently, the vaccines are really the best way to contain the virus compared to any other uh, alternative, which is currently on the continent being lockdowns or, uh, you know, restrictive restriction of people, uh, movement of people and goods. That's largely just, you know, scientifically, it's quite there that, um, you know, even countries globally that have been, you know, more open in terms of their restrictions, but have implemented successful vaccinations have been able to contain the, the spread of the virus. So, all I'm saying is that the public health care response is the only way we're going to be able to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and yeah, I, I'll be interested to hear what other health care responses uh, the, the, the question or the, the participant was referring to, uh, apart from the vaccination. I don't know what else our medical system can do besides that. All right, no, so thank you for your um, response. I hope that has answered the question. Um, Salim, you can go ahead and ask your question. And then, um, okay, I'll just stay on the chat box. Um, yeah, we can go next, but thank you. You can go ahead, Salim. Is um, Salim? Salim. Oh, Sorry. I've allowed you to talk. Um, Unmute. Okay, got me. Got me. <laughs> okay. Can can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks. I I yeah. I I thought you could ask the the the, the, the other question, but 
I thought I'd come in here and just remind ourselves that when we're talking informal sector, informal economy, as the, as the ILO would, would like to call it, it's basically an illegal economy. In other words, it doesn't pay tax. Um, it's, it's in, in, it's, it de facto doesn't exist in terms of IMF, and, and they're starting to think about that. So, so I, I give them some credit. But the reality is that it doesn't exist. Now, when we talk about you know, engaging that sector, on, on what basis do we begin to start engaging a sector that doesn't, in fact, legally exist? Now, I've done a lot of work, and I've done, I'm still doing some work on the informal economy and apprenticeships in the in informal economy and trying to drive that you know, uh, to in, 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 the, in, um, in, in the African context. But, 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 but the challenge is, you know, you, we, we're trying to, to engage, we, we, we're trying to engage in, in almost a phantom, in a sense, without the, the reality that, you know, this is an important sector, you know, and it, it, it needs concerted attention. But as long as the international uh, kind of monetary system doesn't legitimize it, we are in for a hiding to nothing. So there's some comments around that. Um, see, I like, I like the idea about import substitution because I don't think we've, we've done enough in Africa in, in terms of looking at the potential that COVID, and I don't like to use the word potential, that, that COVID has in terms of, of trying to, to, to get some homemade, homegrown products and, and trying to get our economies in play and start trying to get our employment and a whole range of other things in play. So, so I, I found that, that to be useful. But if you can just talk about how do you begin to legitimize a sector that's in fact illegitimate. Uh, you know, I, and, and I, for me, that's, that, that's the biggest issue. Thanks. <clears throat> Um, uh, Zordika, do you want me to go ahead or uh, do you want Sia to answer uh, or Sia, do you would like to answer it or? No, it's okay. If both of you guys can share um, lights, please just um, watch the time frame. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so Sia, uh, an interesting question. Um, I think uh, the existence of the informal economy is not something that governments uh, can deny. Uh, and uh, it would be unfair to exclude uh, also uh, a large number of workers, especially in many uh, much less developed countries in the region uh, that work. Uh, so by some estimates, about half uh, of uh, the economies of uh, many, many countries in the region uh, are informal by their nature. So you cannot exclude half of your workforce, uh, half of uh, your population uh, uh, while counting uh, those people that depend on the income of those informal workers and their families. Um, so you have to be careful how you approach this and also even going by this uh, uh, paying or not paying tax definition um, just because they don't pay for example uh, uh, typical taxes such as value-added tax or uh, personal income tax or corporate tax or what have you it doesn't mean they don't pay any type of taxes a lot of times uh, they pay uh, market fees and uh, many many other type of uh, 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 fees uh, uh, during uh, their operation and often they also tend to buy items uh, 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 before uh, they sell them. Uh, so it's a sort of hybrid uh, legal and illegal uh, way of operation. Uh, but just to reinforce your point, obviously, uh, uh, a lot of countries work in mind in the future uh, that uh, this sector shrinks and formalization is uh, an enduring work. Uh, and often uh, you also see that in practice. Um, as an informal worker, uh, 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 
grows uh, his or her business eventually uh, once they uh, become large enough they cannot uh, escape uh, becoming formal uh, as there are also specific uh, benefits of uh, being formal so you see a transition from an informal to a small and medium uh, and so on uh, uh, enterprise uh, i hope that answers it a bit uh, over to you Thanks, uh, thanks, Gilbisa. Yeah, it's a very interesting question indeed. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think, firstly, because they're not paying sort of corporate or inca, you know, company tax, doesn't necessarily mean that they're illegal entities. And I guess just by the sheer volume and and the, the capacity of the informal sector, it's impossible to deny uh, and ignore. And I think largely the problem you're pointing to is a problem of policy and government being able to accommodate and integrate the informal sector through policy. One example for me that sticks out quite clearly is the South African taxi industry. South African taxi industry caters for upwards of 60% of actual commuters. However, it's highly informalized. And you know, even through the process of taxi permits, uh, government has, hasn't been able to formalize this. But I can definitely tell that whatever approach government has in terms of public transport uh, policy or public transport investment, there's no solution that doesn't integrate the taxi industry. As we've seen with the failures of the bus rapid transit systems in Nelson Mandela Bay, for example, which failed purely because it didn't integrate the existing routes and existing uh, economy created by the informal uh, you know, taxis that cater for more than half of uh, all commuters. In, in the same vein, though, other alternatives, which may not be perfect, but a uh, you know, slightly better approach is uh, the Ria Vaya in Johannesburg, which has formalized a large chunk of uh, what was formerly uh, taxi drivers as part of the bus rapid transit system, uh, Ria Vaya, and integrated them in the process of rolling out that bus rapid transit system. And it's still an operational bus rapid transit system uh, because of its integrated approach. So I think in terms of planning and development, I don't think, especially in a country like South Africa, which has the highest levels of inequality, if we are gonna go according to sort of market approaches to dealing with inequality and ensuring that people, you know, there's more equitable distribution of income, South Africa and you know, countries on the continent need to plan in a way that incorporates the informal sector that accommodates it. Yes, you may not be able to accommodate it the same way you'll accommodate a multinational company because of its large level of contribution to tax, et cetera. But the point is you can't necessarily talk about national development or national planning without a, a plan of how you're going to coordinate or incorporate the informal sector especially if you're going to be looking at trying to redistribute incomes to benefit the most poor in the economy. Otherwise, you know, in the absence of you know, economic planning based around the informal sector, we're then forced to more uh, you know, uh, sort of anti-market policies, such as expropriation without compensation or even allocative assets, et cetera, uh, prescribed assets in terms of uh, prescriptions on pension funds, et cetera which to me, yes, is you know, an effective way to deal with income distribution, but is an anti-market approach. So if we are gonna try and you know, approach redistribution through the market, we have to include and find a way to plan with the informal sector. Um, noted, thank you very much on your response. Um, what one question that I do have is now that um, has do you guys do you guys think that the government or like um, all institutions, whether private or um, public, do you think that the um, efforts that they have made do include um, the informal sector? So meaning that um, have they tried to actually include um, the informal sector in alleviating, making conditions be, and becoming better, um, given that, like how much attention are they actually given and is it enough? Um, yeah, that's one question I do slightly have. 
I can come in quickly just uh, using South Africa again as a case study. Uh, if you looked, for me, the COVID-19 pandemic provides a, a clear uh, crisis that could be used to formalize certain parts of the informal sector, but also to incorporate the informal sector in the planning. But what we've seen is a far greater focus, obviously, on large business, uh, particularly the exporting sectors, whether that be through the 200 billion loan guarantee scheme, which provided, I think, only uh, you know committed around 12 or 15 billion of the 200 billion, but that's paling in comparison to the approach that government was going to take towards the assistance to the taxi industry, for example. And again, the crisis is an opportunity for government to incorporate the informal sector and formalize certain parts of it by providing. Uh, economic recovery, even the, if that's in, in the form of political infrastructure for informal traders, or even loans or even grants to uh, 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 informal traders, but then in return require some level of formalization, whether that be through permits or registration of companies or tax compliance, etc. But the point is, this pandemic and the economic recovery approach that governments are taking is an opportune time for government to incorporate the informal traders, but unfortunately, we're not seeing enough of that taking place. Okay, thank you for your response, sir. Um, it gives me relief to hear you say that it is taking place, but we have not seen it. And I think at the end of the day, if we're looking at a progressing society and all of that, um, I think it's honestly important that um, you are um, support for informal sectors should be given. And I think also before it's too late, um, but yeah, thank you. Um, Alfred had a question. I just gave him the permission to talk. Um, he can raise his question and then we'll take two other questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, sir. Thank you. I just wanted to check, um, I think it's with, with Sia, um, as to has research actually shown if um, the informal traders, who, in my view, who should be dominating in the traditional uh, medicine market, and uh, especially in in Africa, and and I know that it's it, it's not conventional, but is there any notable participation of 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 of, um, of this sector from 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 research um, that can uh, we 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 hear about? So I uh, will respond, but uh, I think Kalbiza might also be able to be in a position to respond. Um, so unfortunately, I don't undertake any sort of micro uh, level research, mainly just at the macro level. But if I can speak about the the dilemma of what you're presenting, that you know the problem of the informal sector being unregulated and providing traditional medicines to a pandemic is not going to be a strategic way to resolve the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, there's just a, you know, a rigorous process that is needed in order to ensure that whatever sort of medicaments or medical response that is provided to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic actually meets scientific and, uh, you know, certain requirements, which I think the informal sector either doesn't have the capacity or capital or assets in order to participate in that process, or in many in many ways ends up being isolated. So there's one example there in Madagascar where they had uh, COVID organics, basically um, uh, or Artemisia plant, which was even being promoted by the president uh, as an alternative to uh, or a, a, a traditional response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The problem is that uh, despite the scientific process that went through in uh, Madagascar, the actual med COVID organics medication itself has proven to be ineffective. Um, and despite personal beliefs about these things, and you know they vary from one person to the next, 
the fact is that the effectiveness and the efficiency of, of, of uh, some of these traditional medicine is either untested or even when they are tested, excludes the informal sector. And in the case of Madagascar, they've actually proven to be ineffective in comparison to the high levels of, uh, you know, the so-called uh, scientifically proven efficacy of vaccines. So I think that 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 creates a bit of a dilemma that, you know, uh, would be a problem in what you're suggesting. Uh, but over to you, Kelby, saying in case you've got anything else to add. Um, and I also have a bit of hesitation. Uh, one thing I can allude to is obviously you have a. Uh, um, uh, uh, traditional uh, medicine sectors uh, uh, across Africa, and obviously uh, these are often done by informal workers to a large extent. Um, but specifically, uh, uh, as it relates to COVID, um, I don't think there have been a lot of studies uh, co conducted, but whatever studies exist, at least of these prominent uh, proposed medicines, uh, there hasn't been any that actually passed uh, uh, through vaccine, uh, uh, through uh, uh, efficacy in terms of its effectiveness. Um, so also certain uh, medicines in certain countries have been promoted by uh, prominent individuals and pro politicians. Uh, to a large extent, I think uh, the reception to that is more negative than positive, I would say. But at least for other uh, types of medication, obviously, you do have uh, an informal, uh, traditional uh, med 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 um, uh, med medical uh, sector. Uh, over to you. Um, all right, thank you very much for your response, Mr. Kalvisa. I have one more question for you. And we have one more question for Mr. Binza, which, okay, so basically the question to Mr. Kalvisa is that you mentioned that um, countries like Uganda, um, basically in the um, information that you shared, you mentioned countries like Uganda, and I've got which other countries, but you mentioned that they have, I think also in Kenya, you mentioned that they have low savings and finances. And um, given that, okay, cool, we're um, in the, given that we have sort of dealt with COVID-19 or so we still are in the process with overcoming um, our economic decline. Um, what do you think is the solution into serving um, basically the countries that do have low savings and finances and um, given the informal sector? Um, yeah, what do you think the solution is to that? If you were to rethink economics or structure it out, um, how would you do that? Yeah, what, what would basically be your solution? And then, um, in a nutshell, um, Mr. Sia, um, what do you think today's um, topic? Um, what do you think? How do you think that contributes to rethinking economics, um, even when it comes to the foundation of setting up um, informal sectors and their contribution, etc.? Um, Mr. Kalbisa, we will start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Um... I think uh, to a large extent, some of the policies that are already uh, in paper, uh, either legislated or not uh, uh, by governments, uh, uh, policy proposals that exist by uh, years of studies, uh, policy proposals reflected by uh, people in think tanks, all those that have been directed towards promoting uh, small scale businesses, they can with um, some minor modification be applied in fact to uh, informal workers. Uh, because 
sometimes uh, the the gap between informal businesses and let's say uh, sort of formal micro or small enterprises is not uh, that big. Um, so, uh, for example, one of these uh, prominent workers uh, to help uh, these small and micro enterprises grow is obviously by facilitating uh, access to finance. Uh, obviously, they don't have a lot of own capital or saving, so uh, they don't need to go to uh, large uh, formal uh, financial institutions or banks. So to help them, a lot of uh, microcredit institutions and so on have been set up. So by doing the same or helping uh, uh, those existing uh, microcredit institutions and cooperatives extend their businesses to informal workers, uh, obviously, through some uh, minor degree of formalization, uh, 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 then we can help one, uh, uh, obviously help uh, those informal workers, two, uh, also help uh, the sort of formalization of uh, the informal uh, sector and informal workers uh, over time. So I hope I understood your question and I hope it, that answers it. If not, you can uh, uh, clarify. Thank you, over to you. Um, thank you, sir, yes, you have. Um, Mr. Sia, can you just confirm that you understand my question? Sure. Um, so look, for me, uh, the short response that uh, the process of region integration obviously involves the movement of people and goods. And I think the discussions and the agreements that have taken place are focused far too much on the movement of goods. And I think for true integration, we will have to find a way to incorporate the free movement of people as well and destigmatize the movement of people across the continent. Uh, and that starts by catering for the informal economy, predominantly, uh, particularly because uh, a large portion of the population still depends on the informal economy. And so for me, it's quite clear from this discussion that whatever discussions are taking place in terms of regional integration at a continental or regional level also need to find accommodation and expression uh, for the informal economy in order to promote the movement of people along with the movement of goods and uh, the promotion of intra-Africa trade. And that's all, thanks. Noted, that was very clear. And then just one more, I'm so sorry. Um, what have there been positive aspects from the informal economy in terms of dealing with COVID-19 um, and trade? Yeah. I don't know if Kalbisa wants to give a go. I think he did mention the general resilience of the informal sector, but I don't know if he wants to respond to that. Uh, can you uh, kindly reiterate your questions, Oli? Oh, sorry, sir. Yes, I was asking: um, Are there any other? Are there any positive attributes in the manner in which um, the informal sector and basically African trade has has it like has the informal sector and African trade been able to overcome certain elements of COVID nineteen? So I'm just asking if there are any um, positive elements um, despite um, yeah um, the virus. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, at the uh, initial uh, early phases of the COVID-19 outbreak, the estimates or forecasts were uh, catastrophic uh, uh, outcomes in developing countries and uh, much subdued uh, uh, shocks to richer countries. But as it turned out to be, in fact, it became the reverse. Um, and this already attests to the resilience of uh, uh, developing countries and uh, a large uh, chunk of it being obviously uh, because of uh, that uh, informal uh, or if not informal uh, domestic economy. Um, so a large part of the economic activity and trade and exchange of goods and services 
is sort of self-contained and isolated from uh, uh, international uh, uh, trade or international shocks. So for that same reason, uh, that sector has turned out to be resilient. The only considerable shock that uh, researchers uh, we have been trying to measure was uh, there were really strict or stringent uh, blanket uh, uh, restrictions on movement, restrictions on trade. Uh, so such uh, aggressive lockdown measures did in fact uh, have uh, some adverse effects in those early uh, days. But once governments realized uh, the damage was a bit too high, and obviously there was also uh, a very strong pushback uh, uh, by the public, also through demonstrations and so on, uh, even uh, so informal traders, for example, fighting with uh, uh, policemen and so on. So once those sorts of pushback uh, uh, really turned uh, the policy space into more or less uh, business as usual, even if obviously there was some health uh, uh, shocks because of that, because there was basically uh, no uh, uh, restrictions, no spaces, no uh, hygiene requirements extra because of that, these people did suffer in terms of health, but its economic effect was subdued for that uh, same reason. And indeed it's a very resilient sector over No, so thank you, sir. Um, there's one more question um, in the chat. So the person basically asks, so CISA asks, um, I think they're, okay, so they're basically asking, what's the panelists' view on micro insurance for the informal economy as part of the crisis preparedness? Um, I'm not sure if you guys answered that, but please share your light um, if you have not. Um, uh, Sia, uh, Sia, would you like to go first or? No, no, you can go ahead, Kalbisa. Okay, so uh, Sia is asking about micro insurance, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, okay, so obviously, uh, even uh, looking at advanced economy, uh, economies, um, especially at the outset, uh, Basically, the insurance business was uh, looking at apocalypse really at the start of uh, this crisis because uh, everything is uh, every business, every everything is going under, so you cannot deal with that. But at least in uh, rich countries, uh, there has been uh, a very robust support mechanism uh, uh, because. Uh, just like the global financial crisis or 809, um, once those uh, key architecture of the uh, financial sector collapses, then everything becomes more like a domino. So you really need to preserve or help uh, that sector. But the trouble is um, when you have such a shock that has uh, a very widespread effect uh, on everybody and everything and every sector, uh, then it would be uh, beyond the capacities of uh, 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 insurance agencies or reinsurance agencies or whatever you call them. Uh, but obviously, for that same reason, uh, for example, some might have even a policy of uh, not getting involved when you have such a, a broad spectrum shock, uh, because they just can't. Uh, 
but obviously it will be very good if there was a scheme in which uh, governments can, governments and uh, government uh, financial agencies or even central banks and everything can work in tandem with uh, uh, small scale insurance agencies that are obviously immensely helpful to the most vulnerable uh, workers and the most vulnerable uh, small uh, level business uh, people. We should always remember, obviously, uh, there are a uh, few uh, huge uh, companies in some countries that uh, turn huge uh, billions or uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. But the largest chunk of business people or workers are employed or working for uh, small level businesses. So uh, saving uh, the macroeconomy is one thing, but uh, saving the welfare and well-being of uh, the population is another. Uh, in some cases, obviously, the two mean the same, but in some uh, cases, they really don't, especially in crises like this, you might see a very different trend bet between the macroeconomy and uh, the welfare of the public. Uh, so. I think it's a very important idea uh, to strengthen uh, micro uh, insurance agencies, obviously, that primarily cater to those small scale uh, and most vulnerable uh, traders. Over to you. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I think this has really covered the points quite well. Uh, for me, it would be just to say, you know, again, the informal nature of um, the informal sector would make it a little bit difficult to roll out some of these uh, financial products or for financial inclusion generally. But I guess it, it is all up to, you know, financial innovation to find ways around it. And I would say definitely something that um, should be looked into. But again, you know, the incomes and the revenue of informal traders and in, in the informal sector, uh, I'm not sure how much they can accommodate to a large extent these um, sort of market buffers, even though they're quite needed. Thanks. All right, noted. Um, thank you very much to our panelists um, who have basically availed themselves and enlightened us some way. And thank you for all of you guys for joining us in this session. Um, please do um, follow our social media pages as the, as the festival only ends tomorrow. Thank you very much and yeah, have a good evening. Thanks everyone, bye. Thank you everyone, bye.